Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Carver School Peace Week. Um, I'm Christopher Mitchell. Uh, I guess I'm probably the oldest inhabitant around here. Uh, I'm Emeritus Professor of Conflict Research, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to be here uh, introducing my old friend and colleague, Jim Adams. Um, uh, Jim and I go back many years, uh, not quite before you were born, but somewhere around there. Uh, and we've been working together in the field, I think, since the beginning of the, uh, of the century. Um, the occasion is the uh, launch of Jim's book, which in itself is a, a saga, a history. Um, it started out as his master's degree, then it moved on to his PhD, uh, and now it's um, it's a fully fledged book uh, published by Cambridge and published quite beautifully, I may say. I've never seen a book that would produce such a fine collection of diagrams and um, figures. Publishers don't usually do this. Uh, they don't it yet. Um, what can I say about the book? Uh, well, it's a most unusual book in that it's a book by somebody who is a, a practitioner or a field officer, somebody who worked in peace operations in a huge variety of places, some of them in my experience, the most dangerous places you could have been over the last 20 years or so. I'm talking about places like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Somalia, Sudan on occasions. Um, and uh, Jim was there really in the thick of efforts to dampen down conflict, to bring some kind of peace locally, and to uh, uh, sort of do this almost you know, flying by the seat of his pants, uh, learning his lessons as he actually had to deal with real people and real, real, real problems. So uh, what you've got here is a book which is properly titled Analytical Reflections on Conflict Zones because Jim knows about conflict zones. He's been in them uh, on numerous occasions. And he's then had the opportunity to, to stand back, have some reflections, have some thoughts, that he hopes perhaps will be perhaps to us as a community and to people who, like him, are ending up uh, in the sound of gunfire uh, and trying to do something about that. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jim Adams to you, who will talk about his experience, his book, and his life. Uh, and then uh, I will also welcome Jeff Helsing, uh, who's the executive director of the Better Evidence Project here uh, at school, uh, has for 30 years been in the field uh, with USIP and a variety of other organizations. Uh, and the division of labor is going to be that Jim talks, presents for 35, 40 minutes, and then Jeff gets the opportunity to comment on the presentation of the book, and then you guys get the chance of asking questions. So, Jim, thank you very much. Cool. If, if you would ask uh, Jeff to introduce himself, I'll do, do that now. I'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, I, uh, I'm obligated to mention that this is in the uh, in conjunction with uh, George Mason University's 50th anniversary and also uh, the, the Carver School. Uh, I think it's 50. 1982. Yeah. Good, good many decades for uh, the Carver School. Also, I'm uh, a graduate of uh, the Carver School under an earlier name, 
a master's and PhD. And uh, so this is kind of a full circle here uh, since 1998 when that circle started. The, uh, um, this, this, this full circle occasion, oh, wasn't ready for that. But maybe I was. Um, let me uh, bring up. That's that's the cover book or the, the book cover. Um, the analytic reflections from conflict zones: a cautionary tale for polarizing America and world. Uh, the origins of this book and the thought process behind it started probably in, uh, well, many years back when I was younger, I was thinking about conflict of various sorts, particularly when I was being agitated by someone or the other, or agitating someone. So the, uh, the genesis for the book proper actually began in Somalia. I was a humanitarian affairs officer uh, with the United Nations and sitting in a, a humanitarian affairs compound in Mogadishu with bullets bouncing off the house, uh, grenades going off around town. And, uh, you know, I, I, in my uninformed uh, capacity, I was asking, how the hell is anybody supposed to read around here with all this racket going on? And, uh, and then I would ask, how is anybody supposed to meditate with all this racket going on? Uh, probably those were selfish questions. And after a point uh, of further unknowing reflection, it occurred to me that I needed to find out more about peace and conflict and about the dynamics and the, uh, the things that make up those situations. So between uh, assignments overseas, I guess uh, I this way. Between assignments overseas, I worked on uh, the master's and PhD at different times, and uh, eventually got to a point where I was looking for uh, a publisher and an editor and how to, uh, you know, getting, getting feedback on how to best make a presentable book. Uh, it's intended for different audiences, academics, students, professionals, and the general public, citizens, uh, which made putting this book together a little bit uh, unusual and complicated in trying to get a message to different audiences. And since I'm no longer working in the field, uh, full time, I uh, thought it best to put what I have to say in a book form and get the get my work out into the uh, the public arena and the professional arena and the peace building world that way. So, why did I write this book and why now? I think I just sort of naturally answer part of that question. Uh, and the book is part memoir, part conceptual work, frameworks uh, involved uh, in the observations that I had and putting that uh, uh, education to use and the conceptual analysis that I had learned from others who had been thinking about these kinds of things a lot longer than I had. So uh, now just to mention, this is my first run through with this uh, slide presentation, uh, presentation using slides. So it's a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, uh, I apologize for any uh, potholes uh, on the road doing this. So the war is over, but the conflict is not. A term that I, a phrase that I had heard often in the field was the war is over, but the peace has yet to be won. And I think there's a further um, analysis to be made uh, on this idea. I think of it more in terms of 
uh, the war is over, but the conflict is not. In other words, uh, the sentiments and perceptions and relationships that were driving the war to begin with are still underneath the surface boiling. And eventually, sooner or later, it, it has to come out and be dealt with. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Another is uh, this phrase or this comment that was made to me by uh, a Bosnian Serb journalist that I interviewed in Bosnia. A little too early for that. Uh, she said, we have more than one truth. And this next slide shows for me the, the different complications and dynamics involved in trying to understand what those different truths are or to try to understand how the human, <laughs> the human elements, the human emotions and perceptions play into how those truths manifest on the ground in conflict zones. And I, of all of these different human elements, I find that resentments and ambitions are key, but more so arrogance and humiliation. And I'm thinking for ex an example is uh, in humiliation and arrogance, the cycle of those exhibiting arrogance and then in turn, eventually humiliation when arrogance doesn't turn out so well in the end. The uh, uh, circumstance in Rwanda, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the term cockroaches was used pervasively over the airwaves prior to the genocide uh, by the conflict entrepreneurs at the time, uh, Utu specifically. And, and, a sim, and, a sim, and this was part of that cycle of arrogance and humiliation sort of mutual offender, mutual victim exercises of genocide to different degrees uh, and civil disturbances uh, had occurred in Bosnia and Burundi, uh, in uh, Rwanda and Burundi for quite some time, for many, many decades uh, into the colonial era. And what can, brings to mind here in this, in the context of what's going on in this country is uh, for example, I heard the term termites being used by a congressional representative recently describing uh, rival party individuals. And in earlier time, in, in this uh, World War II era, <clears throat> Nazis referred to as, referred to Jews as rats. And these sentiments, although in this country right now is minimal, uh, catch on and grow and uh, definitely lead to no good for everyone concerned eventually. And it occurred to me that war is the road rage of humanity. And I mean to take, I take that literally. Uh, for example, encounters on, on the freeway, getting on or off the freeway, or, or some, some uh, disturbance in driving, it pulls an immediate reaction from the, uh, often from the victim and from a, uh, a perpetrator, or simultaneously from both, both thinking in terms of victim or per, uh, perpetrator. And it makes me recall, let's see, how did I put it? 
uh, after a time, it occurred to me that the uh, that even road rage, what I call the tiny wars, and courteous driving are examples of passions of war and peace, albeit on non-lethal, usually personalized scale. Eventually, I began to see that I was a participant in these conflicts, and that I have witnessed that I have witnessed, and part of a solution, if uh, if I choose, regardless of the scale. And this book is also about those that revelation and that uh, war is the road rage of humanity. It's about parts of humanity enduring injury and in turn striding the avenging angel road, the road to hell if taken to this to its logical extreme. And one paved and one paved with stones of arrogance and injury. It's also about magnificent moments of the human spirit and strong evidence of hope. So I, uh, I think of conflict these days uh, as essentially being the same human interaction conflict, regardless of scale. At the individual level, small group, local, community, societal, national, and global. Uh, basically, it's a matter, I see it as a matter of scale and a matter of uh, uh, Negative being a negative peace context or positive peace, and I'll explain more about what that what that means to me. Uh, and one one other thought on this at this moment. Uh, sometimes the journey is humanity's search for redemption and happiness. Sometimes it's a reach for revenge, but it's always a search for balance. And much of what I'm trying to uh, uh, describe in the book and in, and in these models and frameworks and, and such that I talk about in the book. Uh, much of this, much of it is about trying to find that balance. Easier said than done. Uh, so my professional experience, as I say, is in, as a professional field officer in the field in conflict zones, uh, worked for the United Nations as a civil affairs officer, and International Organization for Migration as an uh, operations officer working with refugees and internally displaced. Uh, and in that, in peacekeeping operations, or what used to be called peacekeeping operations, uh, peace and stabilization operations, peacemaking decision makers strive ideally Peacemaking decision makers strive to enable conditions for peace building. Uh, oh, let, let me say, uh, brace yourself, this next slide is scary. As you can see, it's a very complicated world, peacekeeping operations or peace operations. There are needs and objectives, constraints, the operational environment. Uh, the participants, the dynamics, and the factors. And I'm not going to go into each of these, but only to uh, explain that trying to get many different actors to work together, whether international or locally, military or civilian, uh, peace builders or conflict entrepreneurs, civilian governmental people, local, international, uh, makes for quite an interesting set of uh, opinions and interactions. So to simplify things, to back it up, I start with this. The core components of peace operations, and this was initially designed by uh, Dave Davis, a former professor at George Mason, the Peace Operations Policy Program, and uh, before him, uh, Robert Oakley, who was a uh, international uh, UN uh, advisor in Somalia. So many of the graphics that you will see are composites of models and frameworks and thinking from people in the trade, so to speak 
uh, from way back. Uh, <clears throat> manifest and latent conflict. Uh, there are, are uh, a handful of key factors that I'm going to highlight as I go through here. And one of them is this matter of uh, manifest and latent conflict. Uh, the manifest conflict is on the surface and is usually handled by conflict management. In other words, essentially forced and uh, uh, it's uh, short term and based, it's re usually a reaction to short term recent events. And underneath, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the boiling underneath of sentiments and perceptions of uh, feelings and humiliation and arrogance and all of that going on still is generally long-term internalized historical trauma and narratives. I, uh, another point I want to make is that the saying goes that all politics are local and uh, so are basic human needs, uh, security, recognition, identity, John Burton's uh, ideas, and that uh, the interaction between the intervention forces, civilian and military, and the national and local authorities and uh, uh, citizens occurs, uh, well, what occurs in the local level uh, is very similar to the kinds of problems, issues, uh, complaints uh, that I uh, did problem solving for in the mayor's office in San Francisco, uh, the mayor's office in San Francisco, the Citizen Assistance Center. And the distinction being in San Francisco, there was no shooting going on and it wasn't a war circumstance. But uh, in this case, in Afghanistan, the, uh, the military, civilians and police and uh, international and uh, local and national work together often through a mayor's cell set up by the military, uh, convened by the military. So uh, it may be an international major conflict or intra-national major conflict, but still people live at the local level. And that's where many problems need to be resolved. Um, <clears throat> this graphic indicates what I believe are similar human fundamentals uh, that are involved in domestic and international interventions. Again, kind of blurring the line between an international intervention and a local conflict, local intervention. Uh, there are equivalencies. For example, uh, I guess I can use this. Interpersonal small group equates uh, directly to field offices of non-governmental organizations, international organizations. Society, organizational, community levels relate nationally and locally to local groups. There's a state level or provincial level and uh, the national, provincial, local governments. And, and this part here it is the, uh, uh, the levels that the international intervention, the UN, international governmental representatives, uh, that's how they see the world. And that same world exists outside of an international intervention and pretty much at the same levels. And this uh, red line around here indicates uh, humanitarian and peace uh, activity levels and embedded paradigms reflected down here on their issues. Everything that's going on that's boiling, uh, that precipitated the conflict and is agitating and bothering everybody on the intervention side and also on the local and national side. <clears throat> oh, uh, this is the mail truck comes into uh, Afghanistan about once a week to the forward operating base that I was at. So, yeah, that's a graphic for visual perspective there. Daily life, I guess. Uh, 
So in this peace operations uh, compartmentalization or, or categorization, the UN identified in the 90s, mostly after Somalia, uh, three broad categories of activity, peacemaking, uh, peace building, and peace support, peacemaking being uh, more or less the decision makers and coordinators uh, task, uh, fact finding, information diplomacy, the negotiation mediation side, coercion, sanctions, political settlements, agreements, tr and treaties. The peace building is more or less the humanitarian aid side, peace building side uh, that uh, academics and peace building organizations recognize and uh, get involved in humanitarian aid, reconstruction, civil administration, turn and reintegration, human rights, civil rights, economic aid, civil society building, conflict revolution, resolution, and conflict transformation. And I'll explain a little bit of what some of these terms uh, mean. And peace support is the military and security heavy lifting can be involved international police, as well as contingents through the UN, military contingents through the UN. Excuse me, and the observations, uh, their presence, security, logistics, liaison force uh, to suppress violence and command and control. And this graphic, it uh, indicates these primary tasks in coordination. And now, this is a intervention model, not a conflict model, but, but it indicates civil order and civil justice over here, or order and justice. The peace support over here as the security uh, partners imposed order. This is an imposed st stabilization. Uh, pushes for greater order. Over here, peace building, uh, the UN NGOs, international organizations push for uh, social or uh, social justice. In other words, the, uh, the more peace building recognizable activities uh, by those, I guess, would be called soft. Uh, soft intervention. In the middle is the peacemaking, coordinating decision-making uh, group. And the effort is to try to push the whole situation from complex, from a complex emergency, uh, humanitarian emergency to peace and stabilization and uh, coordinating. And this zigzag line indicates that it's uh, uh, two steps forward, one step back often. But uh, that's the general idea. Now, mediation and capacity building is something I want to highlight because mediation means different things to different groups in these interventions. And they're typically position based, whether in uh, Kosovo or Bosnia. And I saw this directly in my work in uh, uh, Kosovo. There's political negotiation and mediation, administrative negotiation and mediation, or project or program negotiation and mediation. And generally the approach by all actors in this scenario are position-based uh, interventions. And also mediation with authority or some have called it mediation with muscle. And it leaves a gap in the dialogue facilitation process because it's generally the adversarial approach where positions are on the table and all of those sentiments and interest uh, are still under the surface, unstated generally, and uh, continuing to drive uh, the conflict or the lack of being able to make progress on uh, negotiations or mediated negotiations and uh, 
progress towards resolving the worst aspects of the conflict and the problem solving approach, which uh, John Burton and uh, others uh, have been explaining for some time, it brings the, the stated problems on top of the table. They, they become, the interests are stated and become a focus of negotiation as opposed to uh, positions uh, and sentiments still being hidden under the table. Uh, an example, uh, an example of that is uh, a uh, a community uh, gathering facilitated by the United Nations in Kosovo, uh, UN inter, inter UN interim mission in Kosovo was done uh, in a, a situation where uh, Kosovo Serbs were returning uh, as, from refugee status back to their village in uh, Kosovo and uh, Kosovo Albanians were returning to the same village and they were having quite a bit of difficulty uh, agreeing on how to proceed in terms of setting up the local municipality again and uh, which flag to fly, an Albanian flag or a Serbian flag or a UN flag. And when in this meeting, which I uh, participated in, the uh, Kosovo Albanian representatives and Kosovo, Kosovo Serbian representatives both have returned to this village got into uh, something of a heated uh, discussion, a very animated discussion. And the Spanish colonel, the uh, uh, UN K4 representative, Kosovo Force representative, military fellow, who was chairing the meeting, slammed his fist on the table and said, there will be nothing controversial said here at this meeting, which in effect, the community interaction into a negative peace status. It was, it created a cold war status in that village, not enabling the groups to really explain, say what they need, wanted to say and uh, try, if nothing else, vent. So that put a lid on that and it just stayed cold war and unresolved for quite some time. Uh, another factor is violence, violentization. Lonnie Athens, uh, a, uh, he's a professor now at uh, Eaton, New Jersey. And uh, he had a lot to say based on his personal experience and his uh, uh, research on the violent, what he calls the violentization of the person, the individual involving brutalization where individuals are brutalized and essentially put through a process of becoming violent, virulent, virulent themselves. And that this, uh, uh, to a point when progressed to its extreme, uh, created uh, people who had to push this violence further upon others and uh, enjoy doing it after, after some point. He also took this analysis to a theory of violentization of communities. And essentially the point is that this same process can uh, evolve from, let's call it an innocent civilian to someone in an innocent village or town or society um, with, uh, that is accustomed to civil ways of doing things and communicating with each other and solving problems takes a society gradually from small group to larger group, community, society, and it can grow to any size if unchecked. And I note down here at the bottom that the violentization, if unchecked, 
can spread to major communities and reach societal levels. And uh, I think a number of conflict zones reflect this in reality. Uh, Rwanda, Somalia, Bosnia. Uh, probably a good, good number of conflicts that you can name experience this to some degree. And this brings to mind what I call the nearest default prejudice level, where uh, in nearest unity level. For example, uh, in a case uh, where there are two different football teams, you know, team A, team B, and, and uh, you all automatically or often certain numbers of people involved in that experience uh, are prejudiced, become repeatedly prejudiced against the other. Imagine this in, in uh, these conflict zones, uh, almost any conflict zone. And the nearest unity level is the same, is the flip side of that same coin. And it can happen in a moment. I've seen it happen in an instant. Uh, in Somalia, uh, there were two businessmen in a, in a town and uh, they'd gotten into a heated argument about a wall they had repaired, a common wall between their businesses. And uh, within 20 minutes, at the same clan, sub-clan level, people, men, women, and children came running from all over town with, with knives and clubs and rocks and guns. And within about uh, 30 minutes, seven people were dead and a good many injured, and we were getting ready for emergency evacuation. Now, probably in this country, the, that precision of nearest default level action is not uh, going to happen, not possible at this point. But uh, just to indicate, uh, it can be very quick and that it's uh, very real. So in contemplating these things, I uh, came up with a, the notion of human realism. And that is essentially acknowledging the virtue and vice in each of us. And that the proven capacity of humanity to engage in inconsiderate, competitive, selfish, win-lose acts at others' expense, the personal gain of wealth, resources. Uh, well, I can't see that other word right there. Power, prestige, revenge, or survival. Uh, and at the same time, this same person, the same groups also encompass the proven capacity of humanity to engage in considerate, more collaborative, constructive processes to understand, to change, to over. Uh, over I can't see that word either. There's a, there's a, a graphic on this side uh, to uh, forgive and to engage in more meaningful discourse for managing and resolving differences. So, and you get rid of the graphic. Uh, you can't move it over here. Okay, for the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, to. Uh, uh, the term also encompasses the proven capacity of humanity to engage in considerate, more collaborative, constructive processes to understand, to change, to overlook, or forgive. <clears throat> Excuse me, I mean, to engage in more meaningful discourse for managing, resolving the difference. In other words, this is a different, I'm suggesting a different perspective, and a perspective that I believe is uh, useful at any level, whether uh, reacting to somebody who cuts you off in traffic, uh, which actually can be uh, dangerous these days, maybe even lethal, or an international conflict or an intra conflict, any conflict. So now back to the basic core components of peace operations diplomacy, aid, security, civil society building. I add positive peace processes and uh, constructive conflict. And so I spent a good 
deal of time and consternation trying to figure out how to get all of these elements that I've just laid out and uh, suggestions for how to draw the picture to help people better understand the circumstances of the conflict and where the thresholds are that, uh, their con that the elements of their conflict are within. So I came up with this uh, uh, series of uh, concepts and models. And uh, in good academic scholarly fashion, I don't think I can do anything with that here. Uh, in any case, piece, th this is the uh, uh, my hypothesis. This this is built out of the master's and PhD. Uh, peace and stabilization operations sometimes achieve negative peace status. In essence, a negotiated political settlement and cessation uh, or suppression of overt hostilities. But despite intense stabilization, diplomatic and re reconstruction efforts often stall without achieving positive peace. And I'll explain, I'll detail positive peace in a moment. In this context, an international intervention holds open warfare or violent civil disorder in check, but, con but conflict party sentiments that precipitated the conflict uh, requiring the intervention are still in place and remain largely unchanged. Uh, about nine out of 10 wars in the post-conflict era are intras intrastate conflicts, meaning internal in a nation state. The Russia-Ukraine situation is uh, an anomaly now. Uh, and about 31 out of 39 wars started between 2000 and 2010, 12 they restarted. So if they have political settlements and peace agreements, why is this happening? Intrastate conflicts are, are not very responsive to traditional nation state protocols and negative peace settlements inevitably erupt into renewed war or violent disorder unless methodically transition to a positive peace situation orientation. And I think of Bosnia specifically right now. Uh, and there's a fundamental divide between track one and track two or governmental and non-governmental interpretation of conflict transformation. And that's essentially structural institutional change versus relationship change. I'll uh, take a sip of water here. Uh, you talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Five yes. Five minutes. Uh, well, if you need a break, I don't need a minute. Just one minute here. I'm a lot more used to writing than talking. And uh, talking and trying to make a uh, coherent presentation of all of this it's, uh, takes some work. So uh, the hypothesis assessing the perceived status of conflict transformation structural and relationship elements within negative and positive peace parameters along a war along a war to sustainable positive peace continuum will yield useful analytic information and indicators by which local national and international civilian or military decision makers personnel and participating communities can move a peace and stabilization operation environment towards sustainable peace so that was my question and uh, task. Now, I mentioned earlier that conflict transformation is interpreted differently, but essentially, generally, not completely, between track one governmental and track two uh, everybody else uh, perspectives on these interventions. Track one tends to think of uh, focus on stabilization, institutional focus, political settlements, technical uh, solutions, uh, and countering violence, extremism, and negative peace orientation. Track two, academics, uh, some think tanks, <clears throat> peace building organizations, foundations, 
uh, citizen groups, religious groups, tend to think of conflict transformation as relationship focused, identity, cultural, and societal and values, and uh, personal transformation, civil society building, and positive peace orientation. But there are some in all of these organizations uh, that are sort of track one and a half. They think in both terms. So uh, the methodology for the scholarly uh, uh, scholarly inclined in the audience here is exploratory abduction or to sustainable positive peace framework uh, is a composite framework of models for assessing structural and relationship elements in notional association with negative and positive peace parameters and peace conflict thresholds. I did it with a one seven, one seven point descriptive scale. And uh, I interviewed 100 people in Bosnia, uh, 50 internationals at different levels, and uh, 50 uh, local folks, citizens, and uh, at all and, and uh, national level individuals, representatives at all levels and across all sectors and across uh, all concerns, ethnic communities. So uh, I used the, net, uh, base, the basis of this was a negative and positive piece of lens. So the focus and the idea was to uh, operationalize the concepts of negative and positive piece. Uh, for example, war or widespread violence and civil disorder are suppressed by coercion. Now, these are my adaptations to uh, Johann Galton's concepts of negative and positive peace. Uh, and he coined uh, or uh, gave us structural violence in terms of concepts and uh, direct violence and other concepts. And uh, utilizing that lens, I, utilizing those lens, I built on them. And uh, also to get at the underlying root causes and conditions of conflict, but not mean that they're, they're not sufficiently addressed in a negative, negative peace scenario. Uh, structural and cultural violence is prevalent. There's no legitimate function in government or very minimal and civil, and, or civil society system that ensures sufficient political security, rule of law, economic, social welfare, and recognition, and identity groups. So these categories have very specific meaning in, uh, in my uh, conceptual explanations. Uh, there are no effective constructive or conflict processes for sustained governmental and civil collaborative dialogues. Stabilization or assisted stability by outsiders <clears throat> is needed. Now for positive peace, the focus is on uh, uh, institutional reconstruction and political settlement, settlement up, and, but also with a greater emphasis on the relationship change and positive peace-oriented initiatives. The underlying root causes and conditions of conflict are effectively addressed in progress. Structural violence is minimal and measures are in place for its mitigation or elimination. There is a legitimate function in government uh, or in progress and civil system that ensures sufficient political security, rule of law, economic, social welfare and recognition and identity for all groups. There are effective constructive conflict processes, conflict resolution, uh, peace building processes for sustained governmental and civil collaborative dialogues. Uh, peace enforcement or assisted stability by outsiders is not needed. This model is a composite as, is, as are many of the models that I've developed or put together. And it shows a, uh, the war to positive peace continuum. 
more or less a, a broad picture of what's going on in a specific conflict. Now, if you don't do the survey, uh, this part of the model, the concept, uh, is still, I believe, valid and useful for orientation purposes, for briefing purposes, because it does show what I believe to be a fairly accurate representation of the thresholds involved in many conflicts at any level. Uh, there's war, violent disorder, fragile peace, a viable peace uh, that indicates that the uh, drivers of conflict, conflict on the thirds, what it might be, corrupt government, uh, mafia, criminal, a criminal government, involved in mafia and different, different uh, uh, very problematic scenarios. And at the point that the institutional performance or institutional capacity is supported and guided and increases to increase its capability to stand against these drivers of conflict. And at this point, uh, viable peace is reached. And that is a point that imposed stability, I believe can be transitioned to assisted stability status. And uh, negative peace is this area that between these thresholds, positive peace over here. And before that there is not just negative peace or positive peace. Before negative peace, there is war. So a violent disorder and uh, imposed initial imposed stabilization when uh, international interventions are involved. So at some point, the idea is that the assisted stabilization is long, no longer needed and the capacity of uh, local institutions, civil society organizations, et cetera, uh, have reached the point where they can carry on on their own without uh, an intervention and start moving toward the self-sustaining peace, positive peace orientation. I'm still debating with myself the difference between positive peace and self-sustaining peace. Uh, self-sustaining peace, there can be a self-sustaining negative peace back here. And that is before the institutional, national, civil society and local groups are able to maintain stability and peace building on their own in a, a, a sustainable uh, condition. So it's five plus four. Okay. So I've already talked about structural in relationship, but Essentially, I divided my uh, analysis between structural uh, factors and relationship factors and came up with this survey. I, I mentioned that I interviewed 100 people. I asked questions. Uh, these are key elements of conflict transformation. I asked questions uh, probing for the status of stable self-confidence uh, matters security, rule of law, economy, well-being, and relational relationship elements also. For example, to what degree is there trust between neighbors of different ethnic groups? To what, to what degree can people of different ethnic groups uh, have empathy towards each other? And the answers to these questions are in the calculations. And I put the calculations on a broad, um, on, a, on a big, picture model where the structural calculations and uh, relationship calculations are dropped down into this uh, war to sustainable positive peace continuum. And you can see what the status of those factors are the, uh, within the thresholds of the broader picture. And you can break it down to the uh, individual elements in this way. So. Uh, I asked three open-ended questions. What is the result? Now, to give some 
quantitative uh, cross-checking to the, the exercise. Uh, what is the result of, of intervention by outsiders? Why do, why do some conflict resolution or peace building ideas not work? How do you improve relations between ethnic groups? And this, um, the answers are in the book. So I'll essentially move on. Uh, this is just further explanation of how these uh, uh, peace operations, how, how my peace operations framework capture the different elements. And, uh, essentially duplicating what I've already stated and the position based as opposed to negotiations as opposed to the dialogue model or efforts. Uh, and this model indicates uh, for assessment purposes and have a selective approach. See if you're on the right track, see if what you're getting into is what you want to get into. There's a general nature of intervention approaches, uh, specific intervention approaches, and dynamics associated with the intervention approaches. So that you can go through this and uh, see if you think uh, your intentions in resolving a conflict or, or intervening uh, match up with negative or positive peace approaches. And this is a actual map or diagram of the intervention model that was actually used in Kosovo, showing which uh, organizations and groups, international and national, uh, what their roles are in coming to uh, the end. So uh, there are many applications, I think, for this model basically is to draw the picture of the dynamics and elements and where people can, and so people can see, uh, better see what's going on in their situation. Uh, sustainable peace of the positive kind, well, this is my idea. Sustainable peace of, peace of the positive kind is the ultimate challenge, desired end state and future of conflict discussion. I believe that this is needed and will be helpful. Uh, this is my author website, and this is my publisher's website, and uh, for information is available. So that's it for me. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, um, and thank you, Chris, for the introduction and, and kicking us off. Um, as Chris mentioned um, in, in introducing me, I am uh, the executive director of the Better Evidence Project here at the Carter School. And prior to coming to the Carter School, I uh, was at the United States Institute of Peace for 23 some odd years, um, and I was head of uh, education and training. So I think the way in which I can contribute to this discussion is to come at uh, Jim's book from a learning perspective. Uh, and I have been wrestling with many of the issues that Jim has uh, illustrated and brought to the fore in his book um, for uh, most of my uh, career in this field. And uh, let me just make one particular comment because I don't think you can really get a real sense of the, the beauty of this book. Many of the, the charts that he had up there on the, uh, on the, uh, on the slides are actually illustrated here at the back of the book. There, there are these incredibly pull out sections with beautiful color and diagrams. And so everything you sort of saw 
uh, in, in great detail is actually very much a part of the annexes in the book. And I'm not sure how a publisher does the little fold out things. I didn't quite see that, you know, other than some of the beautiful children's books that you see. Um, I, I was really taken by that. So part of my challenge in just a few minutes is really to think about how to sort of respond to this, uh, to the analytic reflections from conflict zones. And, and what I thought I would do was just talk about this book as a learning tool, because that really is what, what I think the great value of what Jim has done uh, in this particular book. Um, and one of, a couple of things I'll just note as reflections when I read through the book. The first is, uh, early on in the book, Jim makes reference to someone who I consider to be one of the real great figures in this field. And uh, I had the, the opportunity to really, as a young person, be mentored for a couple of years. And that's Hal Saunders, or Harold Saunders, um, who has uh, who brought into practice what he had learned, not in the peace operations field, but in the halls of diplomacy and negotiations. Al Saunders, who had been Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, who had been engaged in Middle East mediation and negotiation for his career, then went on to become not only a scholar, but a practitioner, particularly around problem solving workshops. Um, and the other thing that Hal did that, that I think is really commendable, and I think is part of what you're trying to do, Jim, is take the lessons from the field and apply them not just globally, but in our own community. So some of what Hal and, and the Kettering Foundation were doing uh, uh, sort of in the latter parts of his career were actually problem solving workshops within the United States. Um, and, and what is it about, about peace building that can be, be applied in our own communities? Uh, the second thing that really struck me after reading this uh, book was you really embody what I would call a reflective practitioner. Um, and I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Michael Lang's um, nine attributes of a reflective practitioner, but I was struck by in just reading your accounts and how you illustrated your ideas about peacemaking that you were exercising curiosity, you were illustrating resilience. Um, wrestling with ambiguity and certainly learning ceaselessly. Um, you resisted certainty and you embraced failure as your mentor, meaning that what you are doing and what you've laid out in this book is really a process of learning. And I think that's at the heart of and the best of our field because this is a field in which we're constantly striving to learn about and show and demonstrate what works, what will help us get to sustainable peace, what will help us in that transition from negative peace to positive peace. Um, and what I thought was really interesting is I've always thought of in my own field, uh, all the work that I've done overseas, particularly in developing training programs as a facilitator in conflict zones, as a trainer in conflict zones, I've always been struck by the phrase bridging theory and practice. Um, but what you've done is really, you flipped this a little bit. And, and what I was struck by is that you really, you were building theory from practice. And what's great about the book is that it starts out as a, as a journey through your experiences and what you've learned along the way. And then through the assistance of your, 
your, your teachers and your mentors and your dissertation committee, you've really helped develop what are learning tools. And that's what I, I think is so important for us as, as ongoing constant learners is that we benefit from new insights. We benefit from the kinds of learning tools that, that you have developed that help us um, not come up with formulas. Because as I thought about you know, how I might respond, I, I got into a bit of the weeds of some of your charts and how you, you, what your, how you were theorizing based on your experience. And part of me said, you know, that's not quite been my experience, or I think I would frame this a little bit differently. But what you did do was you triggered my thinking and you forced me to reflect and think again, okay, how might I capture this? And what would this mean for me as a practitioner? Um, and and that, that's what I think we do in this field that helps us um, develop stronger, more rigorous, richer theories because we've grounded them in experience. Now, there's a caveat with this. And I happen to have finished reading your book right before one of my class sessions just a couple of days ago. And, and one of my students who works in the uh, defense and intelligence field. Um, it made the comment when we were talking about Ukraine, that in fact, that she said the mantra of my field, speaking about intelligence and defense, is that if you've seen one conflict, you've seen one conflict. And I thought about that in sort of thinking about your book in the sense that what do we learn from experiences that are go beyond just, that's interesting, it's really a great story, um, it's a wonderful way of understanding what was happening in Somalia or Bosnia or Rwanda, but how does that apply to what I'm doing here in Colombia or what we're facing in Ukraine, et cetera? Um, how do we move beyond just everything is its own unique conflict at a unique point in time? And how do we build theory that's useful for other conflicts? And I think you are to be commended for what you have developed is, is a real interesting model of how to take experience, how to take and build out um, different uh, uh, events, different challenges um, that illustrate the kinds of conflict theory um, in, in the frameworks and the perspectives that you are trying to really bring to the fore in this, in this book. And I think that's really part of the importance of the peace building field, studying this work, taking, being able to step back and reflect, and then thinking about, okay, what tools can I sort of take from? What kinds of work can help me um, as, a, as a practitioner, as a peace builder, or can help me provide support to other practitioners and peace builders? Um, one of the things that, that I've had a, a couple of discussions about just recently is um, I've been uh, soliciting the input and advice from practitioners who are working at the local level in their own conflicts, particularly in Africa and the Middle East. Um, and, and in talking to them, the question or the request that I get uh, often is, um, where can I go to get a better sense of what others did in my position. Um, what, what experiences did they have? Not that I want to copy them, not that I want to replicate them because what I'm facing here in this small space that I'm working in or this community 
it has its own unique sort of dynamics and factors. But it's so hard to do this work if you're isolated and you're, you don't have the opportunity to reflect upon and sort of set back and think about what, what others did as simply a, a way of kind of wetting one's creative juices to think outside your own context and your own box. And I think in many ways, that's really one of the great values of this book or other books like it that are based upon sort of experiential um, uh, uh, sort of theorizing, if you will. Um, and that's why I think some of, uh, I mentioned Hal Saunders, another person that comes to mind is, is someone like Joe Montville, who also sort of drew from his experiences in, in the field or engaging with respect to conflict resolution as a way to develop new thinking, new ideas um, that really are about praxis, if, if we could use that term. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll just mention, which I think um, is maybe your next step and certainly a challenge for, for all of us is how to operationalize this. So that sort of brings it back full circle, which is, you know, you start with your experiences and you're building theories and frameworks, and then how do you or us collectively, how can we operationalize this and think about how do we then make it meaningful back in the field and in, in the work that we do um, in conflict affected societies again. So I, I certainly commend uh, the book to everyone. Um, um, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's a good read um, because it, it really is, um, he, uh, Jim does a great job of sort of bringing you into the experiences. And then as you get into it and you see, oh, this is really interesting, well-told, really nicely written scenarios. And then you get into, okay, but let's make some real theory out of this. And then, then, then you switch into a more academic um, uh, aspect, which is something that, that most of us engaged in this work are wrestling with ourselves. So thank you for asking me to both respond to this um, and uh, I look forward to questions and, and uh, comments. All right. You might as well give up and completely retire. Uh, the one thing, one of the major things I've learned from listening to this afternoon uh, is um, uh, failure can be a mentor. Uh, looking back, uh, like Jim, I've been involved in some parts of the real world. Uh, and um, I had the unfortunate experience of starting off in the 1960s, working with somebody uh, on a project which uh, I guess could have been characterized as a sort of major success you know, as a piece of conflict resolution. Uh, the uh, thing that we were trying to do, me in a very sort of minor capacity, uh, actually did seem to resolve a conflict. Uh, and as far as learning was concerned, for us, it was a disaster because we thought we were responsible. We thought that what we'd done had, major, had done had produced a major difference. And we didn't actually stop and look at ourselves and say, well, what did we do right? Or was it something else that actually triggered this off and moved it in a different direction? Uh, it took me something like 10, 15 years to realize that um, you learn more from failure than you learn from success. And that's, I think it's a, it's a rather damning kind of a, uh, a way of going about life, but I think it's quite realistic. So my feeling is to the younger end of the audience, don't be frightened if you actually think you've messed up. But learn from what you've messed up. Believe me, you'll mess up. Uh, okay, we've got about five minutes. Uh, uh, I have several questions I 
I want to give to Jim, but um, your five minutes, what would you like to ask? Not me, him. <laughs> so one one question that, that I had was it seemed like uh, in a lot of your models, the there was a real kind of line between when people were shifting from a more chaotic zone of instability and just reacting to, to violence um, different acts to the point where everything kind of uh, stabilizes and then um, enters a more kind of complex, reflective space, I guess, in, in the way that we've talked about it. And, some of the work that I'm doing at the Peace Meeting. Um, so I, I guess what I'd be most interested in hearing a little bit more about was how the results of the survey and the way that people were um, making sense of those con uh, contributing factors, uh, like did it help them pre-identify or anticipate where those points were, or was it more of a retrospective understanding that you're able to gain? <clears throat> well, I, I, on the, uh, the continual model, Lord's and Plastic Peace Continual Model, I went back, uh, I mean, I'm still in Boston, but I went back to a handful of people, and this was before, and asked them uh, to point out on the lower part of that model, you know, the one showing the, the thresholds, negative positive peace, and, and post stability. And, and such. And before I calculated the results, and they didn't know the results. And uh, I asked them to point out, after, after a couple of minutes of explaining that model, how it worked, I asked them to point to that, to place on that model, among those thresholds, on the scale of one to seven, where they thought a particular the status of a particular uh, element fell or falls. And almost in every case, they pinpointed very closely to the result reflected in the survey results. So the model itself is intuitive, pretty intuitive. And they would be able to understand those thresholds because they had lived it. And uh, so, in that regard, it's a good basic picture and briefing tool that people can relate to it. And uh, that might be as great as about. And did you see that the, um, I guess, community members or um, just people outside of the, the agencies also, the peacekeeping agencies also intuited it the kind of same way or were there differences? Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about international and national. Well, yeah. both of them, they, they all Everybody was pretty there. closely pinpointed where the general survey results landed. So, so that says that said to me that the the picture itself of those thresholds works pretty well. It's fairly accurate, and that's coming from that was from Guyana Street to the head of the OSCE and you know, European Union. So it was, uh, it works. I put it that way. And in terms of results, well, uh, Bosnia is still in a negative peace status and it's got problems again. It's the, bump, the boiling underneath is pushing up again. So that was predictable in that model. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Not yet. Oh, no, sorry. Um, well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I see from the comments that you've worked across the spectrum in North Africa, Asia, and Europe. And I wonder about the context that you work in and, and the models that you present. You show the complexity of actors in the situation that is different. But I wonder, uh, which is much of an interest to me, what role does the economy play in the private sector? I think the uh, most decisive factor there is economy is a corrupt uh, 
external political economy or in the show the moral that model helps to reflect the status of that in terms of the institutional capacity to overcome the drivers of conflict, which includes criminal politicization of the economy and the government. That's one of one of the objectives of the criminal law. Yeah, but then it's established business to destroy our Well, it's it's pretty difficult for well-established businesses to operate in that environment. Operate business. So part of the intervention effort is to deal with that. You read the book. Um, um, I was scrolling uh, the parts of it that are taken from the pictures. Okay. I got one. <laughs> Jamie, you got a couple of questions from one of our. Uh, yeah, let's see. So, two questions if someone can pass them on to Dr. Adams. One, how significant are the surveys to this effort? How do you get a sufficient number of useful answers and what is a useful number? 100 question mark. And then there's a second question. Yeah. If you want to try to well, that one the, it's, uh, it's not a, uh, a major survey effort. It's, it's what I could do on my own and on my own dime. Uh, I think it accurately reflects reasonably accurately reflects the actual circumstances on the ground and the circumstances, the conflict dynamics on the ground. And as, as I was mentioning a moment ago, uh, I went back and asked uh, a handful of people, international and national and local at different levels, uh, where they thought without having the results of the survey, and without uh, me having results or they having results, I showed them the war is a, the uh, war to positive peace continuum model and those thresholds and asked them to point out uh, on that model with a little bit of an explanation of what the, how the model works, what they thought the uh, status of several uh, conflict items are like the status of the government and uh, ethnic relations of that and they pointed to almost almost exactly the same place that the uh, survey indicated generally after all the calculations were done so the model is re uh, reflective of uh, it's intuitive and reflective of uh, actual circumstances that people can relate to so it was helpful uh, something that could be done is someone to go back and do a, a full scale major blind study or something, something that was beyond my uh, means at the time and uh, probe that probe that idea further. You got a second one, Jim. It says on slide number 32, the water positive peace continuum, have you used it to simply chart the world's conflicts in your books? Uh, not at this point. Uh, I uh, that that's a, a project that would be helpful. Uh, I haven't uh, been able to get at anything that large myself. In uh, my semi-retirement is running around and uh, trying to get back into the field. What I've got so far, uh, but that's a good idea and. It might be in the next project. I think that's it. I think we've run out of time. That's right. Um, Jim, can you put up and on here the uh, addresses that you did previously? Yeah. And then we can actually, if anybody wants to ask a question, they can do so by the magic of electronic means. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. There we go. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you learned, enjoyed, and go and read the book. It will take you a while.
Well, thank you very much for uh, yeah, listening in and, and this uh, uh, book launch. Uh, now, I think I can officially call myself a uh, author slash celebrity, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Yeah.